Hello, everybody. So I'm Olivia from Jet, uh, Jet Alumni Association, Western Japan. So uh, we are the alumni association in Japan that covers all prefectures west of Aichi, all the way down to Okinawa. Hope you guys are going all right down there. And today we've got a special guest here to talk to us about uh, podcasting, his alumni experience, other alumni experiences, and a lot of those different things. But before I introduce him, I'd like to introduce two other very special people. So first we have my co-chair, uh, John. So if you'd just like to say a few words. Uh, hi, everyone. I am John. I am co-chair with Olivia for Jet A Western Japan, uh, and I'm based here in Osaka. And before this, I was a Jet in Shizuoka. Thank you. And so next we have our treasurer, Rose, who is here. So would you like to just say a few quick words? Sure. Um, happy New Year. Although if this is on YouTube, it might not be New Year anymore. <laughs> but thank you for joining us for our webinar series. And thanks to our special guest for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us. Yes, thank you. Okay, so now to introduce him. So very happy to have him talking to us today. So he's a former JET uh, from Fukushima Prefecture. And so, but he's currently based in Sydney, Australia, all the way down there. And um, he's been involved with the JET alumni community for uh, quite a while, but I believe he'll tell us more about that and about um, his podcasting experience. And so here we have Mr. Eden Law. Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, hi everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is very exciting for me. Thank you. So would you mind, I just gave a very short introduction, but would you mind uh, telling us a little bit more, giving us your jet life in self-introduction, if you would? Sure. Uh, as Olivia said, I was a jet in Fukushima from 2010 to 2011 in the lovely city of Iwaki. Uh, and I was a junior high school teacher, so I had three junior high schools. And I've been a member of the JET alumni for a long time, since 2011. So I'm pretty much already part of the furniture. So, yeah, just, uh, yeah, just a lifer, a long timer and a lifer. And how did you, uh, for starters, how did you get involved with JET alumni? Uh I actually uh, got involved in the JET alumni, my local Sydney chapter, uh, before I even joined up officially as an alumni. So, you know, as you some as people may have guessed, uh, where I was in Fukushima, um, I was I experienced the Fukushima earthquake. So I stayed on um, after a brief evacuation and back in Sydney then I came back and finished my tenure and so during that time like a lot of uh, my fellow Jets in, in the city uh, we started doing looking for ways that how we could you know give back and help our community so one of the things I did was uh, got was to get my students to write uh, English letters you know address it to the world about how their experiences how they felt and the, I knew people in the New South Wales uh, committee, the New South Wales chapter, and they were very heavily involved in helping me uh, and providing me support in getting these letters out there. So I actually came back in time for the Sydney Japanese uh, Festival. And they set up a booth in which we show these letters to the public. And so from that point forward, I thought I really like what they're doing. I, I really want to be part of that and you know, get to do uh, some cool stuff like, like that. So yeah, so as mentioned, you know, 10 years on, here I still am <laughs> basically fossilized on to the structure. So in terms of that, but how um, specifically, because I believe now you've had some experience with Jet AA International as well, so the international alumni community. So could you tell us a bit about that as well? Because that, I think, is something that maybe current Jets or even alumni aren't as aware of. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Jet AA International is sort of the international international versions of the of your local chapter in it that in it that um, the resemblance being that you have the executive uh, offices, the chair, the vice chair, the board advisors. Uh, I fulfill the role 
of uh, the webmaster being, you know, sort of the technical janitor kind of support system kind of thing. And then you have the executive committee, which uh, are, is made up of uh, country representatives from around the world. Uh, the main objective for JDA International is to uh, help build and support communications and relationships between chapters around the world and to maintain communication. So help them work on projects together. And perhaps if there are uh, things from uh, Tokyo, Tokyo uh, headquarters, uh, Claire office, uh, we may communicate that. Uh, so we also support the JET program, obviously, and support uh, JET alumni initiatives. And one thing I want to point out about what JET International uh, isn't, uh, it isn't a, an enforcement um, organization. Like we don't hand out penalties. We don't enforce the rules. So every chapter is still an independent uh, chapters to run their own matters they see fit. We also don't provide grants. We don't have any money, uh, which would be nice if we did have money, but we don't. Uh, so that's those are the, the, the things I think it's also important to note. Um, but yeah, so we, we uh, work on a lot of sort of the uh, bird's eye view, I suppose, holistic view, a lot to do with sort of the jet procedures and help with um, also organizing the international meetings where uh, the country reps from around the world meet every few years to come together, discuss, uh, exchange ideas, reconnect, that sort of thing. Um, I think that's pretty much all there is, yeah, that I can think of right now. That you can think of. Yeah, no, and so I believe the, there's an international meeting planned this year, I think, yep. yeah. So it's probably been a few years, but um, for any alumni who are interested, I would suggest checking out the JetA International website. There is a lot of information on there about how you can get involved. Thank you for talking a bit about your JET alumni experience. Um, but the main reason we wanted to talk to you today was about podcasting. So you've, uh, you've produced written, created, been a part of a podcast um, that JEDA International hosted on their website. Um, so I wanted to talk about why did you decide to start a podcast? Okay. Okay. Um, so I have to say first, like the, the podcast episodes are hosted on SoundCloud, but uh, we show, have a list on the website. Sorry, I'm very pedantic. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so why did I uh, decide to start a podcast? Uh, I, I can't say I, I had set out with very clear intentions or an idea about, oh, I want to start a podcast because it's the thing I must do. Uh, it sort of came about by accident. So in 2016, I was involved as part of the Optijet conference. And I was there as a capacity to uh, advise uh, final year jets about IT careers, post jets, etc. But there were quite a number of people who said, "Yeah, that's great, but I want to know about that." But in Japan, and I don't have, I didn't have any experience working in IT in Japan. So I thought, all right, I'll just uh, take the uh, take everyone's names who wanted to find out and go away and see if I can find people who can help answer this. And then I just organized an online seminar. So I found that to be a very fun and interesting experience. And after some hesitation, uh, I decided, yeah, all right, I'm just going to keep going. Hello. All right. I'm so sorry about that, guys. Um, my The internet in Japan just decided to disappear for me, so I'm back now. So <laughs> I hope that... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, they say the Japanese internet is good. Maybe Australia's internet is better. Who knows? So, <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. So you talked about the reason why you wanted to start one. And um, what I wanted to know is before you started, um, you may have uh, answered this, so I'm sorry if you did, but did you have any other like podcasting experience before you decided to start? Nope. <laughs> no, no, which made the idea of actually starting a podcast even more, um, yeah, kind of questionable, I suppose. 
uh, I am a I'm a big fan of podcasts. Like I I would listen to them uh, as I did some boring admin task at work, or you know I'm doing some low level programming. I'm just like coding and just typing, 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 and then you know that still left some brain capacity. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of podcasts. So I had some idea where I might go when I decided to start one, but it's definitely a, a learning experience a big learning curve which I still I'm still learning basically yes so talking about the the beginning of the learning curve maybe as it was and uh, how did you find the first podcast you recorded I know that the first public podcast that's published is with two alumni in the IT industry in Japan but was that the first one you actually recorded as well yeah pretty much yeah that one uh when I created that two-parter that was actually meant to be a one-off two-parter I didn't actually think that I would continue on but uh, I found it as I mentioned it it was a really fun experience Uh, I liked asking questions and talking apparently and uh, getting into the details and getting to why the how the why people do what they do so I thought, all right, I'll give it a shot uh, and see how we go. It, it was a, a learning experience, a learning curve, as you, as you say, because I had to research about the platforms, I had to research about the te- technology, uh, where I was going to put it, and um, a lot of it, because working as a member of the alumni, you basically operate on the smell of a oily rag. There's There's very little budget you know there's no budget free is good uh so though with that mindset that that uh really influenced the way that i um created my podcast and as you said uh as alumni there isn't much money floating around as it was so how did you find setting the first one up? Uh, so did you use a lot of your own equipment? Did you have other alumni around to help you? How did you find that experience? I didn't use very much equipment. I still don't, actually. Uh, I just, you know, apart from a headset and pray to the internet gods that the connection is good and that the person at the other end actually has a decent enough equipment and a microphone to pick it up because some of the early episodes whew, yeah it's uh it's a bit like they're talking through a snowstorm um and advance apologies to anybody who decides to go back and listen to those episodes uh and uh, so a lot of it was just you know me talking to people and saying hey i want to do this thing would you like to be part of this thing and they said yes i would like to be part of this thing uh so the jet community the jet alumni community are just overwhelmingly supportive and genki as enthusiastic as about getting involved especially if it's done by another jet alumni uh so i'm i'm pretty spoiled i think in that sense and of course, I have to give a special shout out to Claire for uh, providing some of the uh, providing the funding for the hosting on SoundCloud, um, which uh, thanks to another alumni who floated the idea saying, oh, we could probably see if uh, Claire is willing to fund it because it's a career resource. And I go, oh, OK, didn't think about that. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history, a very obscure piece of history but it's history nonetheless you mentioned sound quality before so what are some of the things you learned since starting the podcast about podcasting I guess I definitely I would say this actually I would say that everybody has at least one good story in the same way that the old adage goes everyone's got a book in them everyone has at least one good story even if it happens only when they were on jet, because as a jet participant, you you will have a story, uh, be it hilarious, excruciatingly embarrassing, or whatever. But it is a story, and people just don't think, don't give themselves enough credit. They think they're not interesting, but they are. It just depends on how you ask the question, I suppose, and 
you give them space and you coax them to sit to uh, sometimes more, some people need more coaxing, coaxing than others to, to talk about their stories. But everyone has a good story. On the more mundane side, yeah, technology, uh, I learned that you don't really need a lot of technology. There, there are, um, of course, guides out there on the internet saying you need to buy a microphone, you need to do this, this, and this, which no doubt I could have benefited from. But really, I mean, there's a, there's, I don't really need a DAC. I need a, dec a decent microphone, such as what I've got now, and hopefully everyone can hear me well. Uh, that's, that's good enough. Um, there are a lot of free tools available. I use a free one uh, for sound editing uh, called Audacity, which is uh, pretty complex. Uh, so I've only used a very small subset of it, but it is adequate for my needs. And also I've learned how fussy and retentive I am because I'm obsessively uh, <laughs> editing out the ums and ahs and the awkward pauses uh, because like, I haven't listened to all these podcasts. I'm like, no, that's the only standard that I will accept. I must be like them. I must be like my senpais. Uh, so that takes a lot, long time and a lot of time and effort. So quite exhausting as well. Yes, mentioning audacity, that brings me back to my journalism days, back studying journalism <laughs> at university, the hours I spend in audacity. Uh, audacity is a very good resource uh, mm. that is free. It is very fiddly to use, though, uh, oh, if you've yes. never used it before or if you never had in, uh, any experience with editing before. So I would suggest looking up YouTube uh, or any kind of online resource rather than or before you spend a lot of time fiddling around with it. But Thank you. That was very <laughs> that was very nostalgic for me too. So um, you mentioned that everybody has a story, even if it's just a jet story, or um, and it's about the way that you coax information out of people, get them to tell you what you want to hear or what you think the listeners will want to hear. And uh, without any kind of interviewing or journalistic experience before starting, how did you find asking those kind of questions? I guess I, I did sketch out a little bit of how I would approach the subject matter, uh, listening to the kind of podcast I like. And obviously, you when you start out, uh, you start to emulate and maybe copy. In my case, definitely copy and imitate uh, the, the ones that I really liked. So things, uh, podcasts like This American Life, 99% Invisible, uh, those kind of things. Um, so I start, start out with sketching maybe like a vague outline. Of course, you have to, the introduction and then basically, uh, all right, this person, this particular person is this occupation. Let's ask about that. What maybe there are things that a potential, uh, potentially someone wants, who wants to go into that career might want to know, things like that. Uh, but by and large, uh, I do do like to meander, <laughs> which is part of the problem. Um, if I see something, a topic that just kind of rises up from the deep, like a great big Leviath, Leviathan, which I thought, oh, that's interesting. Let's, you know, follow that and, and follow that down the rabbit hole, mixing up my metaphors there. And, you know, I just like Wikipedia, like I just see where that leads me and what kind of a story that could lead me to, um, you know, just, I structure it but then leave it open-ended sometimes too open-ended uh then which translates into uh a, often a week of editing basically after hours after work so podcasting uh if you it isn't your full-time profession it does take a lot of time and i'm sure it takes a lot of energy so how did you find managing a podcast on top of uh your just regular life and work That's a really good question i sometimes ask it myself <laughs> Um, it is a passion project for sure. And there are, of course, times, it's a bit like any creative work, I suppose, uh, where during the process uh, of creating it, you think like, never again, no, nah, I'm not doing this again. Why? I'm just crazy. Why did I do this? And then once the product is released, like you know, you've birthed that thing into the world and the rush of endorphins just kind of wipes away all the bad memory. You think, oh yeah, that wasn't too bad. That was great. Let's do it all again. I can do it all again. So 
it, it's a lot of, I guess, short-term memory loss. <laughs> but on a, on a more serious note, um, you know, I would do it on weekends. I, if it's a short-ish raw, um, uh, the raw footage been maybe about 45 minutes to half an hour, I could probably knock it over in a weekend. If it's like an hour and a half, then um, I would take a couple hours each night uh, or every second night to just sort of edit it. I first would uh, go through it again and make notes. Um, and as you uh, and you probably remember, uh, Olivia, like how Audacity allows you to put tags uh, at certain points. So I just leave notes like, okay, this at this point, uh, the subject matter said this, blah, blah, blah. And then I look at all that and then I start sort of arranging them into a more sort of coherent and something that tells a story because uh, something I didn't bring up uh, earlier, the guiding principle is uh, telling a story. You could have the most interesting person on your podcast, but if it doesn't tell a story that's engaging, it's, it's not going to work. So I try to create a story, some sort of theme. And once again, hearkening back to the podcast that I listen to because I love stories. You know, I, I love watching movies. I love TV, TV, sometimes a little bit too much, uh, but I love stories and stories are what engages, engages people, you know, right back from, I'm going to sound pretentious, but right back to when we're sitting around in caves around this flickering campfire, telling stories to each other. So that was a little bit pretentious actually, but uh, yes. Yeah, so stories just, that's why I'm so obsessive about editing. Uh, it's not just taking out the, the awkward pauses and the fillers, but also making sure it's, it tells a story coherent because I also found that I tend to ask the same thing, uh, but in different ways, which is a little bit embarrassing. Um, and so editing, you had, I just edit out the, 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 the repeats and hopefully that produces a, an interesting uh, final product. The magic of editing. Editing is magical. That's right. <laughs> so uh, speaking of the stories and uh, obviously to tell those stories, you need to find people who are willing to talk to you. And uh, how did you reach out to your interviewees? How did you get people to agree to talk to you? Yeah, um, I mentioned before like how uh, I'm really spoiled because I'm part of the JET alumni community. And yeah, they just, they're, they're really open to being interviewed by and large. Uh, obviously, I started with the people I knew on JET uh, and or they uh, introduced me to someone they know. But uh, I think it got to the point where I started posting on uh, linking LinkedIn uh, jet groups and said, hey, this is a thing I made. Have a look at it. And sometimes I, I get people saying, I like what you've done. I like, the, I like your effort. I like the sound of it. Uh, include me on your next one. And I'm, I'm always really, really uh, pleasantly shocked that, what, you really want to be on it? You know, it's free, right? I, I, I don't pay people. Oh, okay, cool. I'm, I'm not going to look at give horse in the mouth. Fantastic. So yeah, people volunteer and uh, there are a lot of you know forums, um, Reddit groups, jet, uh, Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups where uh, people say, yeah, I'm a jet and I'm doing, doing, doing this. And then I would drop them a line saying, hi, I'm a jet too. Do you want to do this? And usually it's a yes. So yeah, I've never really had problems so far. How would you say to a uh, potentially alum who want to start a podcast, how do you reach out? So you said the jet community is very supportive, but what are some advice, what is some advice you would have to um, an alumni who wants to reach out to people? How do you find the best ways to reach out to people to get them to agree to do what you want basically? Yeah. Uh, money. No, uh, <laughs> money and drugs. No. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd we don't say endorse the, that. Jet AA Western Japan does not endorse <laughs> any. <laughs> All views are the views alone of the yes. subject matter. Yes. No. Um, the uh, just like me, I'd say start with friends. Um, obviously, being the jet, you would have a lot of contacts made on your during your jet time, and start asking around, saying, uh, "Would you like to collaborate?" Things like that, and then go from there. That's always good. As mentioned, 
being a jet is a bit of an advantage because uh you know we're all part of this community we have we we are part of this community sorry and we all have this shared experience uh we have you know the jet program's been running for 30 something years now and tens of thousands of alumni and growing we are seeing uh in fact i actually know uh an ex-jet whose mother was a jet so we're actually seeing dine something like dynasties coming through you know it's been that long uh and we have jets uh, alumni who've gone on to be at uh every part of uh society doing all sorts of jobs you know we're we're kind of like a bit of a secret society like the illuminati you know like the illuminati and it's a joke i make very often thank you for laughing uh so except we're a lot less focused on world domination and much more about working together and having a good time so yeah i hope that answers the question <laughs> No, that definitely does. So speaking uh, about alumni stories, because that's obviously what you're focused on and what you find really interesting, what are some of the more interesting stories you've heard? And obviously, please edit names. You can edit the content as much as you like to make it publicly safe. Sure, no problem. Uh, and of course, everybody's got a great story. Um, I just chose randomly to highlight some. Uh, so the... I guess one of the, the early ones, uh, I remember talking to someone who worked as a coroner and we talked about the difference between uh, his experience working for the LA County as a coroner and working in Japan in legal medicine, as it's called. Uh, so that was the first episode I had to put a content advisory warning on because um it, it was it, it was scientific, of course, and technical, but due to the subject matter, it could be triggering for some people. But that was very fascinating. And of course, this is not a spoiler to say he absolutely hates CSI because it's highly inaccurate. Uh, one of the last ones I did uh, was with a voice actor in LA who did the uh, voice acting for one, the English version for of the Street Fighter games. So he was one of the characters. So and getting like the idea of like what happens in the studio you know getting like insight into the entertainment industry uh in la um another one uh she she doesn't work there anymore but she used to work uh for a non-profit uh located above the arctic circle so you know people have all these interesting stories we we go everywhere and do everything yeah this it's it is an inexhaustible supply it's just my time isn't i just needed to find the time and resource to to, uh, <laughs> to keep going yeah so i think that's a very good point to bring up and one i'd like to ask you about obviously you don't have as much time as i'm sure you would like to dedicate to making podcasts um how what's some advice you'd give to people to manage podcasting or to keep going um or, you know, when to take a break, when is convenient for you? How do you manage that effectively? Yeah, that's uh, something I'm still working out, really. Uh, but I think that's the reason why a lot of podcasts I listen to, they have season breaks, much like television shows. So they may be they may producing content for a few months and take time off to sort of start building the bank of episodes up uh, just for just, just to basically take a mental health break, essentially um be more structured learn from my mistakes uh be be more structured uh have a clear idea about uh, what you want to go down to what you want to talk about uh, as possible if you do have a plan you know send it ahead to people the subject matter so they have an idea of what will be covered so they wouldn't be too bamboozled or too surprised and you know get a bit flustered about like oh well you know they have to think about on the spot about um what they have to say um but yeah managing time just um and have fun i think essentially if you're not having fun <laughs> it's uh probably not a good thing um find that good balance uh which is easier to set than done but just find a find a good balance you remember you're doing it for fun you don't have to devote your entire time to it unless it's leading to something that could pay off commercially i guess 
And uh, it's a very topical point at the moment, of course, with the pandemic rolling around everywhere. Did you find that um, once the pandemic hit or have you found it more difficult or more easy? Do you think it would be easier for podcasters to podcast through the pandemic or harder? I guess it depends. Uh, For me, in my particular situation, because uh, I actually was job searching um, I was unemployed when the start of the first pandemic. So I had plenty of time, <laughs> plenty of time to talk to people, seek people out uh, and create podcasts. So that was probably my most productive year, <laughs> I would say. Um, and of course, you know, the pandemic has made um, talking on Zoom to be just another aspect of life. It's even more easier now you know there's there's a lot of things you don't have to explain anymore when you said oh you know i'm going to do this and this like oh yeah sure now mind i do that for work so i know exactly what's going to happen so this so i think in that aspect it makes things made things easier uh, i can't really speak for other people whether it's been harder um so yeah i guess if anybody watching this later has an opinion please comment below so uh Going on from that, uh, do you have any more podcasts or any more stories that you're trying to follow up with at the moment? Um, how is your current podcasting project going? Well, it's a bit it's on a bit of a hiatus because I did eventually find a job, uh, and is while well, I enjoy it is is yay, I know right in this economy. Oh my god! Uh, so I do find it enjoy- enjoyable, but it is quite hard going for me anyway so i am working on something which uh i intentionally intend i uh, originally uh i should say wanted it to come out in 2021 because that would have been the 10th anniversary for the tohoku earthquake so with that in mind i had been talking to my cohorts who were there with me during that time so it's been as mentioned, delayed, but I am working on it, trying to put together, and um, hopefully it'll be ready by the 11th anniversary of the Tohoku earthquake, you know, hopefully. Uh, but that is what I'm trying to get out the door at the moment. And have you found that working on such a, obviously for Japan and all the ALT, everyone who was around there during that time, it's such a big event. Have you found... Um, going back to that event through podcasting how have you found that um it's uh unexpectedly i mean i'm not gonna lie it it was there were some emotional moments i guess there were things i've forgotten about um but i think by and large for a lot of us it a lot of the events it's, it's it's interesting to think that it's been 10 years because a lot of those those memories still feel pretty fresh or it does for me anyway I still remember a lot of them like as if they happened last year. Although, you know, with another decade, perhaps they will also fade in time. But the emotional impact and the immediacy of what had happened, that still resonates. That's still stuck with us. Um, of course, there are a lot of like laughs and a lot of like, oh, I can't believe we did that. I forgot that that happened, you know. Um, hopefully I'm not building up the podcast that if it eventually comes out the episode to be better than it actually is but um, it's it was good to reconnect at least with uh, people some of the people I haven't spoken to before uh, with the share experience that we had and unexpectedly do a retrospective about what we went through and of course, because this is the, the pandemic and then compare the similarities uh, of what we went through before and what we're going through now and talk about how perhaps it could have maybe prepared us mentally for the isolation again and um, the things that we have to deal with. Uh, it's not something we thought we'd have to go through again. <laughs> So, yeah, it's been interesting from that point of view. Well, one of the last things I wanted to ask you is uh, if you could just give any alumni just one piece of advice about starting a podcast, what would it be? And um, feel free to take a moment to think about that because it's a very big ender kind of question. Uh, You're telling me. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Don't do it. I don't know. Uh, One, just one. Okay, just do it, I'd say. 
podcast. Just, just do it. Just do it. Do it. Uh, <laughs> um, because podcasts come in all flavors from rambly, unedited flow consciousness, consciousness to sort of um, very highly edited, highly controlled. So just, just do it and do it for yourself. If you feel like you have something to say, say it, really. Um, everyone does. So why not you? Just, just you know, of course, be, be, be a decent human being about it. Nothing like hate speech or anything like that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, for me, I think I'll just pass over. I'll ask my co-host and my treasurer here if they had any questions before I wanted to introduce some kind of other podcasts and other stuff that um, the alumni community work on. So who would like to would, I'll open the floor up? Uh, yeah. Uh, first off, Eden, thanks. That is some very in-depth things about podcasting that I had never thought of before. I am not an avid podcast listener. However, I will listen to one or two on a run every now and then. Um, and you introduced a lot of things that I didn't consider. So I really think that's going to be helpful for a lot of people. So thank you for your time today. Um, thank you. Not about podcasting in particular. However, you did bring up that to get you started, to help you off your feet, um, you applied for funding from Claire. Uh, and that is not something that even once I graduate, graduated from the JET program, finished the JET program, and then uh, was I was uh, just a regular alumni for about a year or so before I became co-chair here. But uh, I did not know that was available until I started here for regular JET alumni. I thought that kind of funding was only available for, you know, official alumni association chapters and things like that. So that's very, I think, helpful information for people who are listening, maybe not a podcast, but want to get something started that might help other alumni. So can you maybe give a brief summary of like what it was like to apply for the funding, to get the funding? Was it smooth? Was it okay? Uh, you were in Australia when you applied for it, correct? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so... I guess, you know, I evoke the every situation is different uh, mantra. ESID applies. Uh, your actual mileage may vary. Uh, so it wasn't too difficult from memory. We did have to make a, a formal submission. Uh, there wasn't a form as such, but I did have to outline a business case for it as to uh, why it was a worthwhile uh thing to to um to fund because you know uh this the the fund comes ultimately from taxpayers money from japanese taxpayers money so there are considerations and it has to be uh wisely spent of course uh so that process but having done that and then watch the process through on their other end and then so got an email correspondence back um I don't know how long it took. I'm going to say months, but I'm not really quite sure. Uh, so that okay. finally came through and say, you know, okay, well, you've been approved. So the procedure, procedure would be uh, you pay the invoice and forward the invoice to Claire for reimbursement. So that's basically the procedure. That's the procedure that I uh, am familiar with. And of course, this is, I don't think this is any sort of secret business stuff because that is the procedure that a lot of um, chapters, a lot of uh, alumni chapters go through. Uh, you apply for funding, you give a business case why, and then you pay for it and then to be later reimbursed by Claire. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's it really in, in a nutshell. Um, once again, you know, I can't vouch for everybody having the same kind of uh, outcome. So actual, actual results and mileage may vary. Disclaimer, 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 disclaimer. Yeah. Well, if you've got a solid business plan, it seems like that you did. So it sounds like it went smoothly because of that. So uh, cool. Thank you for that advice. That was, uh, I think it'll be really helpful for a lot of different people. Um, and then last question from me. Uh, you're an expert now in interviewing and podcasting. Uh, how was your interview experience today being an interviewee? How did our interviewer do for you today? Uh, I would say that you 
are definitely a whole lot more coherent uh, and organized than I am. Uh, have I mentioned the ums and ahs that, that I would, and the awkward pauses that I would have to edit out? Uh, yes, I tend to fly by the seat of my pants uh, with and make things up on the spot. Uh, and I never learn to not do that uh, because I'm not good at that. But it seems that I enjoy um, I enjoy being sort of dang to be dangled over the, the, the pit of fire with um, alligators swimming in lava kind of thing. <laughs> so yeah, no, you, you've done a far better job than, than uh, I have in all my, my years. So I will be <laughs> learning from this experience too. Well, thank you, Eden, and thank you, Liv. No, that's too kind. That's too kind. But I must say, Australians say um a lot. I'm, I, I, I will point that out. We, we, we say um a lot. We say a lot of um and ahs. <laughs> we also just, swear just, a lot, but yeah. Not in this one. Not, not, not now. Not now, because no. I don't think that would be <laughs> no, appropriate no, for good. Claire. No. no. Uh, I just wanted to throw to Rose. Did you have any questions for Ethan? Sure. Um, so I have to admit to being uh, uh, Americans also say um and ah a lot. <laughs> um, just wanted to admit to not being much of a podcast listener. So since you've listened to a lot, do you have a top three or some podcasts that you could um, recommend? And what is it about them that you like? Oh, okay. Um, I, I mentioned uh, several times uh, This American Life. So for an aspect of storytelling, uh, I think it's actually the, This American Life that did a special uh, on the fifth year anniversary, I think it was, of the Tohoku earthquake. And it was a very emotionally hard list, uh, episode to hear where um, there was a farmer, or there was someone, a survivor who set up an empty phone booth because he found it, he, he had relatives passed away. So as part of his therapy or to himself, he would go and pretend that he was talking to those who passed on, on in the phone booth, what got around and that people started coming from far and, and away and to, to ask if they could use the phone booth for the same purpose. I think I don't. I think it might have been a BBC. Uh, was a BBC reporter, but it was it was uh, played again on This American Life, and they got permission to film and record. And some of the most gut wrenching stories, some of the amazing, um, but really really uh, sad uh, things you hear. So, but the way that they set out the narration. And the rhythm is something that I aspire to and still yet to get there. 99% of visible is also uh, has a lot of stories, uh, talks about stories, human stories, which I like. And uh, top three only, man. Uh, well, just, as many so as many. you want to share. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess uh, stuff they don't, how stuff you missed in history class because I, I love history. Um, there is, uh, let's see, Hack, which is a local like Australian, it's Triple J. So it's reportage. So they, they talk about like current affairs and topical issues, things like that. So it's more straight out kind of reporting and those small uh, stories, new stories and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so I'm sure there's a lot of worthy ones that I've uh, completely forgotten about, but yeah, I mean, that should get, get people started. Thanks for the suggestions. Thank you. So on that note, I will just mention, um, there are a lot of podcasts that Jets and Jet alum are involved in. So if you are interested in checking some of them out, uh, so there's the Jet Wit, um, I don't know if you've heard of them. They're the, uh, they're, they're a website run by Jet alum. And they're not associated with JetA International, I believe, but they post uh, a lot of content. They do a podcast beat, um, which I'll post info about. Um, there's podcasts about anything and everything. Um, so definitely, so a couple of them, Japanese culture, US law, design, poetry, a kaiwa, professional development. So there's a lot of, 
um, alumni doing a lot of different things. So definitely, um, if you're interested, give them a check out. Um, and there's also a very famous alumni who does a very famous podcast and he's also a YouTuber. Um, so you may have heard of Abroad in Japan who was a JET alum, a very famous one. So he also does a podcast um, about Japan. So definitely there's a lot of alumni out there doing a lot of different things. But Eden, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on today and talking to us. And um, can you define us off? Where can we find you and your podcast? Well, my podcast uh, can be found on SoundCloud and iTunes and wherever good sound, uh, wherever good podcasts are found uh, under um, After Jet. And it's also some of the episodes are also on the web uh, in the on the jetaainternational.org website on the podcast. So there's a selection of some of the more interesting uh, curated list of some of the more interesting podcast episodes. So, yeah, or you can email me at uh, webmaster at jdainternational.org. Um, and if you want to be part of it, uh, uh, not just be interviewed, but maybe help uh, lighten the load <laughs> and help create it, please let me know. I'm always uh, eager to help. I'm great. I'm always grateful to accept help. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just to round off, we are Jet AA Western Japan. So uh, if you're an alumni from anywhere from Aichi to Okinawa, um, we hope that you've enjoyed this or anyone listening from around the world, we hope you've enjoyed this webinar about podcasting and the alumni experience. If you'd like to help out with us or get in touch, um, all of our email addresses and content is uh, you can find it. We're on Facebook and LinkedIn. And um, on our website, you can track us down as well. So that's all from us. I hope you're having a lovely week and we'll see you all very soon.